This morning I read uh, for you the, the text that we're dealing with and I think perhaps to read again this evening might uh, take a little bit too long so I am going to be making reference to those portions of this text that we didn't deal with this morning um, and I think pretty much most of them are going to be displayed on the screen so what I would like to do is just simply begin by reading one verse uh, from this text which I think is perhaps the heart of what it is we're going to be looking at and certainly is where we get the title to this particular sermon. Verse 37, John chapter 6, verse 37. Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Now, there are other things, of course, that the other portions of the text are going to add to this, uh, but um, we do want to see this particular truth, and this is actually the second point of the sermon this evening. The first point is nobody comes to the Father unless the Father actually draws him to himself or to Jesus. May the Lord grant us his blessing as we look at um, these particular passages this evening which are quite clear and yet very controversial in the church today as you know this is what separates Calvinists and Arminians if we can use those terms. Although, um, basically, it, I guess you might say it separates those who believe what the Bible teaches versus those who really have a difficult time with it. Because it does place salvation squarely in the hands of God and not in our hands, and that's something we don't like. We like to have control. But God is the one who has control, and that's why he also must receive all the glory for our salvation. Now, I've already uh, mentioned this morning we were looking at the first point that our passage teaches regarding the fact that Jesus is the bread of life. I've already made reference to that this evening. The table is laid this evening also to remind us of that very thing. Jesus is the one he says you must eat of, that you must feed on. But again, by faith, not literally, not carnally, not physically, but by faith if you are to have eternal life. And what he means by that is you must repent of your sins and trust in him if you are to hope to get to heaven. And we also saw that having received him by faith, having come to him for that initial meal as it were, you must continue to feed on him every single day. If you're to be spiritually strong, that's the only way you can be because Jesus is the only source of spiritual nourishment. He's the only one who has that food. You must come to him on a daily basis if you would be spiritually strong. If you don't, then you really can't expect anything but lethargy and weakness. I think perhaps one of the greatest reasons we often fail to, be, you know, to achieve what it is the Lord calls us to be and to do what he calls us to do lies in the fact that we don't feed on him as we should. And again, this is just simply another way of saying we need to use the means God has given to us to build us up in our faith, to gain more of the Holy Spirit, to be spiritually stronger, to have a greater love that we might serve him. We have to feed on Christ the means of grace or the way that we do that. Again, I would point you to those devotionals that Greg has written that remind us how to use the means that God has given to us, how to make the best use of those means so that we may be spiritually strong. But again, as I noted this morning, this passage also contains a second point. It tells us why there are some who believe and why there are some, or I should say many who don't, why some hear the gospel and reject it, actually most, while others believe. <laughs> and follow Jesus Christ even though there is a great cost, even if it means that they have to lose their lives. It has to do with what we call irresistible grace. The work of the Father drawing his elect, those whom he has chosen, to Jesus Christ by his Holy Spirit. Now this evening I want us to consider two main things from this text. I've already told you what they are. The first one is if you believe in Jesus, it's because the Father drew you to him. And that is the only reason. And secondly, the Father will draw everyone he has chosen to Jesus. Now, the first one has to do with increasing our thankfulness because we owe everything to God. 
The second one really has to do with confidence, the confidence we can have to share the gospel with others that the Lord will actually use that to bring the lost to faith in Him. So the first point is this. If you believe in Jesus, it's because the Father drew you. Now our passage, again, is, if you remember what it was from this morning, uh, shows us first that there were some who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, but there were also many who did not believe. Now Jesus tells us that the call of the gospel is to be universal. It is to be preached to everyone. Again, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This means, among other things, preach the gospel to all the nations. And he says in Mark 16, verse 15, this very thing. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. You see, the gospel is to be published to everyone. It's to be shared with everyone. There's no reason why we should withhold it from anyone except, I suppose, in those occasions where you've tried to share with them on numerous occasions and they get angry with you and perhaps become violent with you. There comes a point where Jesus says not to cast your pearl before swine, but you have brought the gospel to them and they have clearly rejected it. It is to be brought to everyone. He also tells us that everyone who responds in faith, everyone who believes, everyone who receives Jesus Christ will be saved. And we see that in verse 40 of our text, John chapter 6. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. But we also recognize that as the gospel is published, that there are many who hear it who don't believe. And obviously this shouldn't come as a revelation to you if you have shared the gospel with very many. I think we would all admit there are relatively few among them who actually do believe and there are many who do not believe. Now maybe we tend to think that the problem is that um, they don't get to see Jesus. I mean this is a matter of faith, isn't it? Perhaps if they could see him, perhaps if they could just witness a miracle, maybe that's what they need in order to come to faith in Christ. But I do want to remind you from our text that it really has nothing to do with seeing Jesus physically. And it has nothing to do with his miracles because in our text, these people who did not believe, the many who we will see withdraw, actually saw Jesus. They saw his miracles. These were the ones who were fed, the 5,000, who were fed with a few loaves and fish. And yet, they still didn't believe. Jesus tells them as much in verse 36. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Our Lord Jesus Christ reminds us in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verse 14. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called outwardly by the Gospel. Again, the Gospel is to go to each and every individual that we can reach with the Gospel, to every living creature. Many are called... But few are chosen, few respond in faith and repentance. Again, Jesus reminds us of the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14, as he encourages those listening to him, among whom were many that would later withdraw, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and there are few who find it. I just read recently um, somebody who had a sermon or a book that was going to show us why it is that the majority of mankind that has ever lived would be saved and enter into heaven. But I read passages like this and I find that difficult to believe. Jesus says that the way that leads to destruction is broad and there are many who enter through it. The way that leads to life is narrow and there are few who find it. So the outward call of the gospel is broad, but those who actually respond in faith and repentance are actually quite narrow. What Jesus said about that is true, but this also shows us that it's not because they haven't seen Jesus and it's not because they haven't seen miracles 
Miracles do not save. They weren't intended to save. They were intended to stop traffic. They were intended to cause amazement. They were intended to verify the messenger who was speaking was actually from God. Miracles can make people follow Jesus for a while, but it's not enough, they're not enough, to make them follow Jesus to the end. If there's a sacrifice that has to be made, they won't be willing to make it because miracles can't change your heart. Without a change of heart, without faith, no one is going to follow Jesus to the end. Now we saw this morning that Jesus preached the gospel to this crowd. This is again the crowd that saw the miracle of the loaves and the fish. Jesus was preaching the gospel through the imagery of bread. Remember, you have to eat this bread of life the Father has sent down. He said it again by way of symbolism and he also said it plainly. You have to believe in the Son of Man. You have to trust me, the one, the, the Messiah who's come down. But ultimately, even though he preached the gospel to them, ultimately they withdrew because they didn't believe, because they didn't have a change of hearts. And we read about that in John 6, verses 60 through 66. And again, this is just after Jesus had explained that he is the bread of life. You have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, Does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he was saying, for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted from the Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Now we're going to come back to a couple of statements in this extended passage here. But I do want you to see a couple of things. One of the questions we need to ask is, and, and I think we often get this impression when we read this this, this passage, this whole text. Did these people leave because they didn't understand what Jesus was saying? If Jesus had spoken in plainer language, which he did actually, believe in me, and he hadn't used the imagery of the bread from heaven, if he hadn't said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, would they have believed in him? Jesus is actually telling us here that in their current condition, apart from his grace, they would not have believed. As a matter of fact, he said, if that confuses you, if you have difficulty with that, what if you should see me, this is, that is Jesus, uh, bodily assumed into heaven? He goes, you, you would not believe. That would only stumble you more than what I've had to tell you. So if they couldn't understand their need of Jesus' humanity, of, of him as the Messiah, of his flesh and blood, as it were, for their, their salvation, the ascension of him into heaven would only have confused them more. The problem is they didn't believe. Jesus tells us that quite plainly. He knew there were those there who didn't believe and who wouldn't believe no matter what Jesus said, no matter what he did, no matter what miracles he performed, because their hearts were unchanged and that's why they ultimately left but we need to note that there are also those there who did believe by God's grace in verses 67 through 69 so Jesus said to the twelve you do not want to go away also do you Simon Peter answered him Lord to whom shall we go you have words of eternal life we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Now again, the, these disciples, these really 11, not 12, okay, they heard Jesus as well. They heard what he said. They heard the thing about the bread of life. They heard about the eating the flesh and drinking of the blood. And yet they responded in a way different than the rest of the crowd. They responded in faith. They knew. They were convinced. There was nowhere else they could possibly go. There was salvation in no one else. 
This one was the Holy One of God. This was the prophet. This was the Messiah. And so they would not leave him. They could not leave him. You see, if you have this genuine faith, if you have this change of heart, then you're going to stick to Jesus no matter what. There is a big difference. So the gospel is published to all creation. There are many who don't believe, but there are those who do. Now the question we need to ask is why? Why did those who believe, believe? I mean, we know why the ones who didn't believe didn't because of the condition of their heart, but why were there those who did believe? Why is it that you have believed? Because the reasons are the same. Well, I think in our text we have at least three reasons why it is you believe, why it is the disciples believed, and these, you know, these who believed in him did believe, and the others didn't. And the three reasons are because the Father chose you, because the Father drew you to Jesus by his Spirit, and because the Father has determined to give you to his Son. You believe, first of all, because the Father chose you. And again, I think we, we looked at this not too long ago, so we won't want to dwell on this a long time. In verses 70 and 71, Jesus, in response to what Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have words of eternal life. Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet, one of you is a devil. Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Now as we look at this passage, we understand that there are some people who believe that Jesus was speaking here about his choice of them as his disciples or as his apostles. In other words, okay, I chose you, did I not choose you? Well, I chose you to be my disciples. And not, this isn't talking about election, but we do need to understand that Jesus is answering the question why it is, or explaining to them why it is that they are sticking with him and the others are leaving. I do believe that Jesus is speaking about their election to salvation. Of course, if this was the only text we had, there might be some question. But as we've already seen on other occasions, the Bible clearly teaches that God does in fact make a choice of whom he will save and whom not. Paul writes in Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. I want you to notice from this text that he chose us in him. He didn't choose us because he foresaw that we would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We looked at that, I believe, last week. He, he foreknew us, he foreloved us, not because of what he saw we would do apart from his grace. All we would do is basically deny Jesus, hate Jesus, never receive Jesus. But rather he foreloved us and chose us in order that we might actually trust in the Lord as we're going to see in just a moment. But it was his choice. He chose us before the foundation of the world, that is before he created anything. This was his eternal plan, this was his eternal purpose. And he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ. This is what God predetermined. By the way, this passage that says, where Jesus says, Did I not myself choose you, the twelve? Also reminds us that there is another choice that God makes. And this is the one where we, we need to um, think about just how much we owe the Lord. Because he not only chooses whom he's going to have mercy on, but he also chooses those he's not going to have mercy on. Uh, the word in theology is called double predestination. There are those who seem to think that God only chooses whom he's going to save, but he doesn't actually choose whom he's not going to save. But I hope you understand, if God makes a choice of whom he's going to save, there's also a choice being made who's not going to be saved. And we see that quite plainly in the case of Judas, the one who was chosen to betray 
the Lord Jesus. Uh, Jesus prays in John chapter 12, 17, verse 12. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them. And not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. You see, Judas perished, or he was going to perish. Jesus is talking about it as though it's a done deal, but it hadn't yet happened. So that the scriptures would be fulfilled. He says in Matthew 26, verse 24, The Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Again, Jesus is speaking about Judas. Now, I know the question often comes up when we're thinking about Judas. Could it have been someone other than Judas? Was it, you know, that Judas chose to do this of his own free will? Well, yes, he did, as a matter of fact. But could it have been anyone but Judas? No. Because Judas was chosen for this very purpose. Jesus actually called him called him specifically, knew what he was when he called him, knew what it was he was going to do. That's something that's clear throughout Scripture. He was a devil from the beginning. It was in his nature to betray Jesus. Even during their ministry, the comments on Judas's, he held the bag and he used to pilfer the bag while they were ministering. He stole money out of their common bag. And why is it that he betrayed Jesus except to get money? That was his nature. And it was his nature to turn Jesus over as it was prophesied of him. And he was chosen for this very purpose. And I want you to notice the consequence of his choice. Jesus said of him, it would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Now again, look, what does that mean? It means it would have been better if Judas had never existed than to have to spend an eternity in hell. By the way, I point this out because you need to understand, well, actually, this is probably one of the clearest passages in Scripture, that the Bible doesn't teach annihilationism. You know, there are some who believe that those who are saved go to heaven, but the rest get annihilated. They don't suffer for an eternity. But that's not what the Bible teaches. It would have been good for Judas if he had never been born. If he was annihilated, he would be the same as he had never been born, you see. So he can't be annihilated. Why is it good or would have been good if he had never come into the world? It's because now he's going to have to spend an eternity in hell. And he's going to spend an eternity in hell because of his sins. Now, we, we think about this for a moment. We think, wait a minute, Jesus chose Judas to betray him and for that he's going to have to spend an eternity in hell? That hardly seems just. But re remember this. When he says this about Judas, he doesn't mean Judas is the only one who falls into this category. Everyone who doesn't trust in Jesus, the same thing is true of them. It would have been better for them if they had never been born. If you don't trust Jesus Christ, if you never trust Jesus Christ, it would have been better for you if you had never come into this world, if you have never been created by God and never existed because you're also going to have to spend an eternity in the same hell Judas is going to spend eternity in. That's why you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You must trust him while you still have that opportunity. So the fact is God does choose. He chooses those whom he's going to save. We saw that quite plainly. Uh, Jesus said he chose the 12. And, and again, he chose them for different purposes, the 11 to save the twelfth Judas, that he might be the betrayer and that he might be condemned. He was not chosen to eternal life. We saw Paul say the same thing basically in Ephesians chapter 1. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Secondly, if you're a believer here this evening, you believe because having chose you, the Father drew you by his Spirit. And here we again have one of the clearest passages in Scripture as to the only way you or I could ever come to Jesus Christ and trust in him in verses 44 and 45. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. 
Now, we do need to understand this all, who are going to be taught by God, is reference to Jews and Gentiles and not to each and every individual because not everyone is taught by God, not everyone learns from the Father, not everyone comes to Jesus, but those whom the Father draws to him. Now, last week I reminded you that this passage is not speaking about uh, permission. He doesn't say no one may come to the Father or may come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. He says no one can come to me. No one is able to come to me unless the Father literally compels him, drags him as it were. I mean, the, the word actually has more force than just simply drawing. Uh, I believe as R.C. Sproul on one occasion said the same word is used to refer to somebody who throws a bucket down into a well and draws water out of the well. You have to compel that water to come out of the well. It's not going to come willingly. You have to send the bucket down. You have to pull it up on the rope and overcome gravity and get it out of there. Well, the Lord has to do the same thing to us if we're going to come to Christ because we come into this world, as I mentioned before, bent against Him. We come into this world dead in sin and unable to come to Christ because we don't want to come to Christ. Paul writes in Ephesians 2 verses 1 and 2, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience in this dead condition. You could not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We could not believe in him. We could not trust him. And the reason is because we did not want to do that. We had the faculty of choice. We have a will. And we can exercise it one way or the other. But we wouldn't exercise it towards him because our hearts didn't want him. We hated him. That's what Paul writes in Romans 8 verses 7 and 8. Where he reminds us because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, those who are in the flesh, that describes what we are when we come into the world. We are flesh and only flesh, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God, which is why Paul says in Romans chapter 3, there is none who seeks for God, there is none who does good, there is not even one left to ourselves we would perish because we would refuse God. Even though he sent his son into the world, even though he offers his son to us, we would continually refuse him because of our spiritual condition. So if we are to come to him, something has to enable us to do it. Something outside of us because we don't have that ability. We are indisposed toward the Lord. The Father, Jesus says, must draw us. He must compel us. And thankfully, that is what he was pleased to do in our lives. Now, we do remember that when the Lord does this, he doesn't do it against our will. He doesn't drag us kicking and screaming into the kingdom of God. The way he does this, the way he compels us is by changing our hearts, drawing us, as it were, from within. He opened our eyes to show us our need of Jesus Christ. He changed our hearts so that we would want to come to him by his Holy Spirit. Note what Jesus says in John 6, verse 63. I told you we're going to come back to this passage. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and our life. At least they are if God makes them powerful by the Spirit of God. The Spirit was the one who convinced us that we were sinners. The Spirit is the one who showed us our need of Christ. He's the one who caused us to love Him so that we would come to Him. So it's because of the Spirit's work that we trust Jesus while others don't trust Him. Again, Paul reminds us in, I forgot to put the, well, it's 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. Hopefully you found that. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. Have you ever experienced that in your evangelism? Have you ever found anybody who thinks that the gospel is foolishness? Why do they find it to be foolish? Because the natural man who is in the flesh, who is hostile toward God, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. 
Because to them or to him it appears as foolishness and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. The Spirit of God gives us that faculty to see its truth and to see its desirability and to receive it. So the Father chose us and he drew us by giving to us his Holy Spirit to change our hearts and to open our eyes so that we would see the beauty of the things of the gospel so that we would come to Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, the Father did all this. He chose to save us and to draw us by his Spirit because he had determined to give us to his Son as a reward for his work. And that's where we get these references to the Father giving Jesus this particular people. Verses 37 through 39, note, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me. I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Now notice Jesus here is referring to, to those whom the Father has given to him. Those are the ones the Father has chosen. Those are the ones the Father draws by the Holy Spirit. These are the ones that the Father has determined to give to his Son. This is what Jesus gets from his work as our Redeemer. This is his reward. He gains the approval of his Father because he did the will of his Father, but he also gains glory and a kingdom, a kingdom that is populated by redeemed people that are predestined to become like him that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And that includes you if you are trusting in Jesus this evening. If you are trusting in him, it's because the Father had determined to give you to his Son and because he had determined to do that, he sent Jesus into the world to live and die for you. He sent his spirit to, uh, to draw you to himself when it was his time. The reason why you believe, the reason why you've trusted Jesus, the reason why you were willing to come and eat of this living bread while others refuse and perish is because God had mercy on you. And again, what, is it, what difference does it make? Well, it makes a huge difference that you know this I mean, it makes a difference in your salvation, otherwise you wouldn't be saved. But it's important that you know it so that you might give God glory for these things. He didn't just send the Son into the world and offer Him to you, and then you chose to come to Him. He sent His Son into the world to live and to die for you, and He sent His Spirit to draw you so that you could believe in Him. Salvation is from first to last of the Lord. Now that's the applicational point for us from this text, but I want to also make a, um, an evangelistic point, and that's the second point. And it comes from the passage or the part of the passage that I just read. Jesus tells us that all that the Father has given to him will come to him. Everyone the Father has given to Jesus will come to Jesus. I hope you can see the evangelistic thrust of that particular thing. They're all going to come. Jesus says he will receive them. Anyone who comes to me, I'll certainly not cast them out. Jesus will keep them. And Jesus will eventually bring them to glory. Now, first of all, they will all come to him. When Jesus was evangelizing, we understand that he met with a great deal of opposition. I think mean, nobody was hated more than Jesus. Sometimes we think if we do everything perfectly, people are going to love us. Well, Jesus was perfect. He did everything perfectly. And the vast majority of people hated him. Okay, he met with a great deal of opposition just as we do when we do the same thing, when we evangelize, we meet with opposition. But Jesus did not lose heart because he knew that his father had promised him a people and that eventually they would all come to him. He says in verse 37, all that the father gives me will come to me. Now we need to understand that this is our confidence as well. That when we evangelize, we go out knowing that there are some who are going to be saved. Now, again, knowing what we know about the nature of man, that they're hostile toward God, they don't submit themselves to God, we might be tempted to think 
that no one's going to come. Everybody's going to get angry. And I think that oftentimes you know, stops us from evangelizing. We say, what's the point? We're just going to make enemies of all these people, so why, why even bother? Well, we bother because the Lord commands us to, but we also do because of what Jesus says here. The Father has determined to reward His Son. The reward is those that He came into the world to save. And so the Lord will bring them to His Son. There is nothing, just as there's nothing that can ultimately take us away from the Lord, there is nothing that can stop Him from completing this work. God will save. The Father will give to His Son everyone that He has chosen to give to Him. So if you are willing to share the gospel with others, and that is necessary, those people the Father has chosen need to hear the gospel or they're ultimately not going to be saved. So they will, they will hear the gospel, but they do need to hear it in order to be saved. So if you're willing to do that, and you are living a life that is consistent with the gospel, the Father will use you to save those sheep of Christ, those whom He's chosen, the ones you come into contact with. And that is the reason that you can be confident that your work is going to be successful. Now, you may not necessarily see those individuals come to Christ. Maybe you will. Maybe you'll plant a seed. Maybe you'll water a seed. Or maybe you'll be blessed to actually see the harvest. But the Lord will use you when you come into contact with sheep. By the way, when you're sharing the gospel with those who aren't chosen, you're not wasting your time there either because the Lord tells you that's what you need to do. It's a blessing for that person to hear the gospel. What they do with it is, of course, they're going to have to answer for that. Um, if they choose to reject the Lord, it's not because the Lord is making them reject Him. It's because of their own sin, and they're going to have to suffer for that, just like Judas. When he betrayed Jesus, God didn't force him to betray Jesus. That was his nature. That was his desire. He chose that freely, and he is suffering for it because of that. But Christ's work with Judas was not wasted, wasn't wasted on him either. God has a purpose behind everything that he calls us to do. So first of all, be encouraged that all whom the Father gives Jesus will come to him. Secondly, be encouraged that all who come to Jesus will be received by Jesus. Again, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Now, what that means is that when you offer Jesus to someone, you can tell them, if you come to Jesus... He will receive you. He's not going to reject you. I mean, we don't have to worry, as it were, about election. If a person's willing to come, Jesus will receive them. Of course, they can only come if God is drawing them, but if God's drawing them and they're, and they're willing to come, Jesus is going to receive them. So again, you see, this, this is the, uh, well, again, this, this is the, the free offer, as it were. This is God's willingness to save all who will come to him. But I also want to apply this just to those of you here this evening who perhaps haven't come to Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, the question that all this that we've looked at can raise is how can you know that Jesus is going to receive you if you come to him? Because we've seen you have to be chosen. God has to draw you by his, his spirit. How can I know that I'm chosen? How can I know that the spirit of God is drawing me? Well, the only way that you can know is by coming to Jesus Christ. If you don't know him and you want to come, it's because he is drawing you. And if you want to come and you do come to Jesus in faith, you can know that he's going to receive you. Jesus says he will not turn you away because if you come to him, he knows that you're one of those that the Father is actually giving to him. If you want to come to Jesus, it shows that he is actually drawing you. Now, I should mention that is if you want to come to him for the right reason. If you want to come to him because you really want to come to him, because you really do love him, you, you desire him as a savior, and he is a beautiful savior to you. In other words, if you're coming to him just because you want a ticket out of hell, that isn't enough of a reason. I mean, it is a reason, and we all have come to Jesus because we want to be saved, but there has to be more than that. There has to be this change of heart that desires Jesus Christ 
There has to be this work of the Holy Spirit, which clearly in Scripture we are told is love. Love for the Savior, love for the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, love for His people, love for His law. If we don't really love Jesus, we haven't truly come to Him. We've come, as it were, against our will because we're afraid of hell, and that's the only reason, but not because we really want the Savior, not because we really want to go to heaven, not because we really want to turn away from sin and the world to follow Him, and as it were, to push our way into the kingdom of heaven. You can only do that if your heart is changed. But if that is what's going on in your heart, then it's because the Father is drawing you to Jesus if you really do love Him, and He will receive you if you come to Him. Thirdly, Jesus says here that all who come to Him will never perish. If you come to Jesus and Jesus receives you, you can also know that Jesus is never going to let you go. Jesus says, this is the will of Him who sent me, that of all He has given me, I lose nothing. Jesus is even more explicit in the, what we call the Good Shepherd Discourse in John chapter 10, which we'll eventually get to, Gospel of John. Uh, chapter 10, verses 27 through 29. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So if the Father has given us to Jesus, we will come to Jesus. All whom the Father gives him will come to him. Jesus will certainly receive everyone who comes to him. And all that he receives, all that the Father gives to him, he says, all that he has given me, I lose nothing. I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me either. No one can take, me, uh, take us out of his hand. And that's, he says, because the Father is greater than all and no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. So if you come to Jesus, you are secure. Jesus will keep you. But again, only if you come to him in love because you love him, because the Father has drawn you by his Holy Spirit. And then finally, Jesus says, he will raise these whom the Father draws and gives to him and um, that he receives. He will raise them up on the last day. Verse 39. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Basically, Jesus is saying that if you come to him, that he will not only keep you, he will make sure that he raises your body on that day, but even further than that, which is included in this, you will be acquitted on the day of judgment, you will be rewarded for the things you do for him, and you ultimately will be glorified with him in heaven. We are told by Paul, I believe it's in Philippians or Colossians 3, that when he appears, he's going to transform our bodies into the likeness of his own glorious body. As a matter of fact, this is so certain to happen that Paul speaks about it in Romans chapter 8 as though it already has happened. He says in verses 29 and 30, For those whom he foreknew, remember we looked at this passage last week, for those whom he foreknew or foreloved, and basically this has to do with election, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Notice the past tense in each of those verbs. Paul looks at it as though it's already done because in the mind of God, in the plan of God, it already is done. And basically there is nothing that can stop him from doing it. So if God has foreloved you, if he has chosen you, and as you see, he's predestined you and so forth. If he's called you, that calling right there is the same thing we're talking about here. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. The way he draws him is by this change of heart by the Holy Spirit. That is what we call that internal call, that work of the Holy Spirit to bring us to Christ. If he has called you, he has justified you. Because when he calls you, he makes you alive. You trust in Jesus and you are justified. And if you are justified, you also have been glorified 
Not that you're in heaven right now with Jesus, but you are so certain to be there that it's referred to in the past tense. So the question that, again, this text asks you this evening is basically this, adding this morning's with this evening's. Have you come to Christ? Have you fed upon Christ? Have you participated in this heavenly bread? Do you have the assurance that you're going to be with the Lord in heaven? And is it an assurance based upon truth and not just kind of a hope for kind of thing? I mean, most people you ask today if they believe there's a heaven at all, there's, they believe there's a God at all, of course they all really do. If you ask them which of the two places are they going to go, heaven or hell, they say, I'm going to go to heaven. Why? Well, because I'm a good person. Uh, because my good deeds have outweighed my bad deeds. I mean, they have all kinds of reasons why they are going to end up in the good place and not in the bad place. But you realize that if that's their belief, they're going to end up in the bad place. It doesn't matter what they believe about where they're going to be. What matters is what's true. And the Lord says that unless we receive Jesus Christ, unless we believe in Him, unless we trust Him, unless we feed upon this heavenly bread, unless we eat His flesh and drink His blood by faith trust in Jesus, we're not going to see heaven. We have to trust in Him. Now, if you've done that, again, I would remind you, don't thank yourself that you've done this because you didn't do any of this. God did it from first to last. It was His plan. He executed His plan. The only reason why you're trusting in Jesus is simply because He drew you to Himself. We can't really thank ourselves for any part of it. So I would encourage you this evening to give him all the glory for your work of salvation. But if you haven't come to him, I would again urge you to come to him now. Come knowing that he will receive you. If you don't want to come, then you need to look at what happened to Judas. Jesus said it would have been good for that man if he had never been born. If you don't come to Christ and you die in that condition, the same thing will be true of you. It would be better for you if you had never existed. It would be better for you if you had never been born because now you're going to face an eternity of suffering in hell. If you happen to be in that condition where you do not want to come to Christ, you're not trusting Him, you don't want to come week after week, you hear the gospel and you don't respond, that's going to happen to you unless God changes your heart, unless the Lord draws you to Himself. Now you see, this puts, as it were, the ball in God's court. It's not in your court. You can't just tuck the gospel in your back pocket. You can't say that I'll just bring it out at a convenient time and then I'll trust in the Lord once I've gotten everything from this world that I want, then I'll get serious about following the Lord. You can't do that because you have no guarantee that the Lord is going to call you and draw you at the last moment. So what do you do? Well, the only thing you can do is ask God for His mercy. God is the only one who can grant it to you. All you can do, if, if the gospel has been preached to you, the invitation has been given to you, you don't want to come. The only thing you can do is pray that God would change your heart by His grace, that He would issue that call to you, that He would draw you by His Holy Spirit to the Lord Jesus Christ that you might take hold of Him. If that's your condition this evening, I would again urge you to seek the Lord while He may be found, that you might receive His grace, that you might take hold of His Son, Jesus Christ, and receive that life which is only in Jesus. There is no other way you're going to get to heaven. You're not good enough. You came into this world a sinner. You've done nothing but sin since you came into the world. You have no good works to outweigh your bad. There is a good place. There is a bad place. You're on your way to that bad place unless you trust Jesus. So trust the Lord Jesus. Come to Him in faith. Seek the Lord for His mercy until you're able to do that. May the Lord grant you grace to do that. Let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's uh, thank the Lord if we know him and let's pray for his grace and mercy if we don't.